The human brain is the great new frontier, isn't it? No doubt about that. It, uh, it defies understanding in many ways. But it also defines who we are and what we do, and we know so little about it in relative terms. But we are learning more, and, and the more we learn, the more fascinating it becomes. I've been reading this book this week, The Brain That Changes Itself. It's written by Dr. Norman Doidge. Uh, Norman Doidge, a psychiatrist and a researcher, and he travelled around the United States meeting brilliant scientists, championing this thing that I'll get him to explain called neuroplasticity and the people whose lives they've transformed. And they're just remarkable transformations. As the doctor says in the preface, this book is about the revolutionary discovery that the human brain can change itself, as told through the stories of the scientists, doctors and patients who have together brought about these astonishing transformations. Norman, it's good to talk to you. Thank you very much for your time. Great book, great read, fascinating. Thank you very much. It really is that. You better just explain at the beginning, though, the title, The Brain That Changes Itself. Changes how? Well, you have to put it in context. The context is that we thought that the brain was sort of like a machine with parts, and each part performed a single mental function in a single location in the brain, and that the circuits of the brain were hardwired, meaning that they were formed and they were finalized in childhood. And one often hears that, or one often hears people comparing the brain to a computer. But this turns out not only to be wrong, but it's actually spectacularly wrong, because the way the brain really works is by constantly changing its wiring and changing its physical structure. And the thing that drives that change is mental experience. So uh, sensing and perceiving can change the wiring in your brain thinking, even imagining, and, and of course, acting and doing things will change the structure of the brain. And the implications are immense because for 400 years, that view of the unchanging brain meant that if a person was born with a mental limitation such as a learning disorder or had a stroke in the womb or had a stroke later on in life, or if they wanted to preserve their brains as they got older, there was nothing, and the brain was deteriorating, there was nothing that could be done because machine, these machines, hardwired machines, do many glorious things, but they don't grow new parts or reorganize themselves. So I describe um, a lot of changes and new treatments and new way to, ways to approach being human, really. So, Norman, as I said, fascinating stuff. Do we know how those changes are made, and are we at a point yet where we can actually facilitate those changes? Well, we most definitely know the answer to how to facilitate those changes. That's what the book is about. It's in many, many domains from you know helping people uh, with learning disorders learn better. Uh, IQs, believe it or not, can go up with certain exercises. Um, people who've lost parts of their... I have a story of a woman who was born with half a brain. Uh, the part that processes speech for most people was completely missing, and yet she learned to speak stories of people with stroke and brain trauma who've been able to make uh, improvements, people with chronic pain. Now, we know a lot about how it happens, but not every detail. What we do know from um, Nobel Prize winning work in the year 2000 is that when you learn something, um, what happened is that genes inside the nerve cells in the brain are turned on to make new proteins, which in turn uh, make connections between the nerve cells. So in fact, genes are actually turned on by mental experience. This is a, an extraordinary discovery. For, for us laymen, give, if you can, and you talk about things in here from obsessive compulsive disorder to all kinds of anxiety issues that relate to uh, practical to Alzheimer's, to dementia, and things like that. How does what you were just talking about relate to some of those things? Um, well, we got to break them down. Okay. So I'll, let's take OCF. The question of Alzheimer's is up in the air. We know that we can reverse something called age-related cognitive decline. Age-related cognitive decline is not a disease per se. It is, but it is something that we all have in this culture when we get to be around fifty. Um, and uh, it's when you start to forget where your keys are uh, and the, forget the names of people at parties and so on and so forth. And it's a function of not using our brains properly. Basically, this, the brain, this plastic brain, 
uh, turns out to be a use it or lose it brain. And it means you've got to keep it in good shape to main just to maintain your memory. And as we get uh, to middle age, what happens is we usually are spending most of our life replaying mastered skills. <laughs> what I mean by that is, you know, when you were in late high school or if you, one went to uni or some college or learned a trade, there were periods of time you were studying very hard, like learning a new subject or vocabulary or something. That's the level of training you have to do to keep your brain um, in maintenance shape. But most of us by middle age are basically doing things we've done many, many times before. We replay mastered skills. Our, our occupation mm-hmm. job is the same. Our sure. mate may be the same and so on. And if when that happens, you lose mental power. But brain exercises I describe in the book can reverse that so that 80-year-olds can function the way they did when they were 70 or 65 if they give their brain the proper kind of workout over a period of about six weeks. For something like OCD or post-traumatic stress disorder, plasticity isn't always good news. If you repeat negative things, if the brain repeats negative things, it gets better at it. So a person who keeps reliving a terrible trauma or someone with obsessive compulsive disorder who keeps doing the same compulsion over and over again, the brain gets better and better at doing that and it sort of wires um, negative experiences into the brain. And what we use is our understanding of neuroplasticity to, in fact, overcome what you might call negative plasticity. Well, I was going to ask you about that. Okay, so you've got OCD as an example. And as you say, the more you uh, you repeat the habits created by OCD, the better you get at doing those things. How, how do you rewire it or change that? Okay, so this is a little bit complicated because we're talking about the brain. Um, it's not a, a one-step process. Basically, all of us, all human beings, whether we have OCD or not, have something called the worry circuit that was discovered on brain scans in our brains. So when you spill wine on your shirt or tablecloth or say something to the boss you shouldn't have said, there's a part of your brain that detects that error, which is it's right bef- behind the eyes. It sends a message up to another part of the brain, a little higher up and further back, which makes you anxious about it so that you'll attend to that mistake and fix it. And those two things together, noticing the mistake and feeling anxious, we call the mistake feeling. And then in a normal brain, once you've corrected the mistake, there's a gear shift further back in the brain called the caudate, and it automatically moves you on to the next thing. It turns the mental page so you can just put it out of your head. But in people with OCD, brain scans show that that whole circuit is always firing and that that gear, mental gear shift isn't working. Now, most of the treatments we had for serious OCD didn't involve an attempt to actually um, move on and change the gear shift. Uh, sometimes we tried to understand the original causes of the obsession or compulsion, which meant we were thinking about it a lot. The behaviorists often will expose you if you're afraid of germs. It'll expose you to germs, and the cognitive behaviorists will get you to try to say what's irrational about it. And lo and behold, there's a danger that what that does is it just keeps you stuck in it. So that this new treatment called brain lock um, gets you first to recognize that you're having a problem, but the problem isn't germs or what you said to your boss. The problem is your OCD, your second guessing. And then you have to have a series of fairly healthy, wholesome activities prepared. And then you kind of manually shift that gear shift by forcing yourself to do something else. Now, that may sound deceptively simple, but none of the existing treatments took that approach. Yeah. And it's, it's had some very remarkable results in mild and moderate and moderately severe OCD. Okay, look, um, I know you're very busy, and I'll give details of uh, where the book's available, etc. And just a moment. just before you go, though, I was mentioning to our listeners earlier on. I saw a report out of uh, the UK, I think it was overnight, where they um, they did all this research, and they they showed that optimists have a much better chance at succeeding at any particular thing than pessimists. And, and in your book, you've got a chapter called Imagination: How Thinking Makes It So. Mm-hmm. Do those things tie together? Uh, to to some degree, yes. Yeah, some degree, yes. Um, but they don't always have a, a better chance. I mean, if you were optimistic about the stock market, you know, a couple of years ago, 
uh, you wouldn't do well as well as the pessimist. So, the, you know, you have to take these studies with a grain of salt. But all else being equal, you know, everybody kind of knows this. It's helpful to be confident. It depends what they tested them on. All right. Just finally then on imagination, how things, how thinking makes it so. How, how does that work? Well, when you, let, let's say your, your, list, your listeners are listening to me right now. There's a, a group of neurons in their brain that are firing that are allowing them to recognize the frequency of my voice. If they close their eyes and just imagine my voice right now, it's the same neurons that are firing. Or if you look at me and then you close your eyes and imagine me, it's the same neurons that fire when you imagine and remember as fire when you're actually perceiving. So what that means is you can use um, imagination to activate neurons and to modify them. And so this is something I never really believed in. I always thought it was just wishful thinking. That when athletes, for instance, go through various mental exercises, what they're doing is, you know, they're stewing on their events, but they're not helping themselves. But actually, as you imagine doing various motor exercises, such as, you know, a complex dive, mm-hmm. or if you do what Glenn Gould, the Canadian pianist, did, at a certain point he stopped physically practicing, and he simply practiced um, by imagination. You really can improve it. And I have studies in, in there that show that people who just imagine playing the piano uh, particular songs and were compared to those who were actually playing it, those who imagined playing the piano had basically the same changes in their brains as those who were playing it. And over a period of a week, though, if you gave those who imagined it just one hour at the piano physically playing it, they got to be as good as those who had been physically playing it all the time because <laughs> the same circuits are activated. And I'll be talking about a lot of this at the Brisbane and Melbourne Writers Festival. Well, we're well, welcome you to town. Uh, as mentioned, uh, Dr. Doidge will be at the Brisbane Writers Festival uh, Monday, 6th of September, as well, for his final Australian presentation. That'll be at the Brisbane Convention Centre. Uh, and I'll... It's on my website. I'm it's all there. Several talks. And we'll talk to... and after the Brisbane. All right, mate, and we've talked to our friends at Demix. They've got your book too for those who'd like to have a look at that. The Brain, The Changes Itself. Dr. Norman Doidge, enjoy your stay in our country, Norman. Thank you. All the best. It's uh, coming up 28 to 11. More of your calls next. 13 13 32, our number.